Chapter 7 According to the monks, the winter solstice had passed, and a new year had dawned. It was 1542, the year of our Lord. And as the pueblos burned, the Spanish stood along the hay and waited for their orders. They had their rest. Their winter had ended, and they were finally ready to reach Cavera. The men turned to Coronado and watched his ominous gaze. He stared in the pouring rain. He formed a grimace and whispered to himself incoherently. Then he stared above, perhaps at the angels that had long forgotten about him, and his men stood in the distance. It is a circle, isn't it? he said. Cruel, yes. Unfortunate. My dreams. Fortunes. There. His man watched on strangely. Coronado went on and sputtered. I have no... I have not any. The thought escaped him. He leaned closer. He rubbed his head. The man approached. Sir, your orders. What are your orders? Bring me the Turk, he said. Then Coronado turned and walked away. The men searched all over the Pueblo, and for a moment it seemed as if the Turk had completely disappeared. They found him a quarter of a mile north. His head was planted face down in the dirt. He seemed to be praying. He looked swollen and beaten. The men took the Turk by his limbs and carried him towards the center of the camp. They brought the Turk to Coronado and dropped him to the ground. And with a dagger clutched in his right hand, Coronado approached the Turk. They stared at each other for a long half minute. The Turk remained on his knees with his hands clasped behind his back. And Coronado stood upright with his head bending over. Get up, Turk, said Coronado. Get up. The Turk refused. Then Coronado grasped his dagger and lowered himself to the Turk's face. He dangled the dagger and gritted his teeth, forming a wide grin. The Turk looked back. His eyes grew wide and sweat poured down from his cheeks to his chest. But Coronado continued to grin. Then Coronado slit the Turk's face with a quick slash. A spew of blood dribbled and landed on the hay. Coronado stopped and stared. Then he laughed and placed his dagger back in his cloak. He circled around the Turk's body. A full minute passed. Coronado's mouth hung open. He placed the dagger back in his cloak, walked up to the Turk, and held him by the chin. Get up, Turk. But the Turk remained on the ground. Then Coronado yelled and swiftly kicked the Turk upside the head. The Turk coughed up more blood. Then Coronado turned around and saw Cardenas and Castaneda standing behind him. They remained silent and alarmed. Is he alive, sir? said Castaneda. Oh, yes, he's alive, said Coronado. He leaned over and grabbed the Turk by his hair and examined his face. He's quite alive, aren't you, my old friend? The Turk coughed and sprayed out blood. I suppose he's tongue-tied at the moment. Pity. The Turk bled from his mouth. Coronado again held the dagger to his throat. He whispered. Then he shouted. Show us the city's Turk. We've waited and suffered long enough. Kivera. Kivera. Show us these cities. Show us these goddamn cities! Our rest ended. We gathered the horses and caravans, and we left Tiji. East was the only given direction. To Kivera the holy and great Kivara, our kingdom. It could have been a million more miles away, but it didn't matter. We didn't care. The snow stopped. 
but the rain did not. During the end of our stay at Tiji, horrible bouts of endless rain followed. The air was cold, and the wind was just as horrible. And some days, it rained all goddamn day. Coronado had lost most of his patience, if not all of it. He shouted his orders from high and yelled at the men to keep up their pace. Never in my life had I seen him so angry, so deliberate and forceful. And most of the time, I found Coronado at the front of the line with a Turk at his side, seemingly glaring at everything in the world. Days blurred, one after another, but the land had changed. The hills were gone. The desert had passed. The land became flat, and it became very hard to judge distance. Everything looked the same, and there were no trees of any kind. And for days on end, a never-ended field of high, stalky grass was the only visible thing. We thought it would pass. It did not. Each day got worse and worse, and the land became flatter and flatter. So we rode and marched forth, east, through the God-forsaken plains. And once again, we found nothing but stalks of wheat, rye, and grass. Then the captains gathered and gave their suggestions. They agreed that the best way to go about this flat land was to assign small parties to go north, south, and east. And it was also noted that the men would be split into pairs to explore more of the land. When Coronado was asked his feelings upon the matter, he gave no objections, though by the looks on his face, he seemed distracted. He only requested that he himself would be the sole chaperone of the Turk and all had nodded and agreed. We drew lots. I seemed to draw the shortest. I was assigned to the youngest scout. His name was Carlos. From his first looks, I sensed that he was a generic, dumb 17-year-old. But the more I examined him, the more I determined that he was the oldest-looking 17-year-old I had ever seen. He was one of Tovar's men, which explained much. And I slowly drew my own conclusions. We trekked forth. Carlos went on foot, and I rode on the mule. When I gave Carlos the general orders, he looked at me with general disdain. We established a mutual trade of bitterness and distrust, and for the first day, we hadn't said a word to each other. Carlos was reticent, extremely so, and for the moment, I was glad. The last thing I could afford was to be stuck with another Bernardo. Though, I'll admit, there are many times that I miss Bernardo. I miss that dumb little bastard. I miss his exuberance. And for long stretches of time, he remained on my mind. I kept a good 10 to 20 paces distance from Carlos as we headed north. The land was so flat that it became extremely difficult to keep focus. Our only refuge was the morning sun. Every morning, we reassured ourselves, pointed at the sun, and nodded to each other in agreement that indeed, we were headed in the right direction. My mule had its moments of miracles. It kept sturdy and paced itself well through the grass of the prairie. And for the most part, it remained well behaved. On the third day, the morning sky stretched in an impossible color of blue, and what little shreds of clouds were left had disappeared in the blinding sun. For hours, I saw nothing but prairie. I rocked back and forth as the mule pressed on. Then I felt a single drop of rainfall on my hand, and I looked up to the sky. Towards the end of the day, the sky turned black, and a gathering storm approached with purple hanging clouds. The wind switched from east to south, and I knew exactly what was to come. You better find shelter, I said. It's getting dark. But I knew Carlos hadn't listened. I shouted again at him and repeated, but by then, the rain intensified. Suddenly, it poured down on us in heavy streams. The rain turned to ice, and for ten minutes, hail clanked off our armor. And it came down so hard and fast that both of us fell to the ground and covered our heads. It fell in chunks and sounded like hammer blows slamming down. And for a whole minute, the sky opened and flooded the ground with a splattering of shattering ice.
when the hail ended, a silence came over the land. I looked at Carlos, then back at the mule. Carlos kept huddled, his body shook, and as I turned to him again, I noticed that he had finally looked frightened. He looked at me, still frightened and afraid. I offered my hand and forced myself to smile, but he simply refused. Days drifted into each other. Hours and hours of silence followed us, yet there was no relaxation. My horrid, ungodly thoughts crept back as they always did, and I tried to escape them, but they only inched in closer. And as I dipped my head into a trance, the voices in my mind returned and murmured. And again, I fell into the visions and the dreams, those horrible dreams. Sometimes I felt like it was Satan himself talking to me in our own private language. Yet my deepest questions remained unanswered. The questions of why repeated again and again. Why I believed. Why I was still here. Why was I still alive? The thoughts again piled on like the hail from the day before. And all I could do was try to survive its wrath and pray my head would not explode. I concentrated on my breath. I distracted myself the best I could and kept in time with the rhythms of my mule's footsteps. Then I remembered the song that the little boy had played on his guitar back in the valley of the Corazons. The sun set several more times, yet the further we rode out, the less we saw. We saw no tracks, no trails, no streams, no trees. Two more days had passed, and I decided that it was time to return. I told Carlos we would rendezvous west to the main army, as I'm sure others had already done the same. On one particular day, Carlos went out too far. For a whole half hour, I could not find him. I was petrified and shouted his name over and over, and in the piercing wind, my shouts came back in echoes. But as I turned my back, I saw him in the distance, bending over a small dip in the plains. Carlos, I said. There was no response. Where have you been, man? Carlos! He dragged his way over. He held a strange, dull object. It was an oval shape, and it looked very familiar. It was a helmet of some other Spanish man. During the night, we made a fire from the brush and flints and leftover tinder. We spoke about the helmet and who we thought it belonged to. And beneath a star-studded sky, we finally talked. There's nothing more in this life than I want than gold, I heard him say. Yes, Carlos, I've had those thoughts too. We told each other our life stories. His words were soft, and his stories were terribly boring. I'm sure he thought the same of my stories. And when we finished, we drifted in and out of sleep and memory. Do you think we'll find it? He said. We'll find it, I said. It feels like my entire life. I've been chasing this dream. You must feel the same way. Don't you, Sardina? I didn't answer him. But by then, Carlos had already fallen asleep. In the morning, I stared at the gray embers of the dead fire. I was still in the daze, still drowsy, and my heart pounded so much that I clutched at my chest and lay on my side. I looked back at the fire, but Carlos wasn't there. Later, I found tracks of his boots in a muddy set of sand. I rushed over and followed. About a half mile down, I saw smoke rise from the sky. And about two miles later, I saw a row of Indian houses by the banks of a small stream. I got off my mule and led it to water. I saw a tribe gather out from a far distance. I couldn't scream out for Carlos because I knew the natives would run after me. So I stayed motionless, and the tribe saw me and shouted. Then in back of me, I heard the slashes and slits of a sharpened sword. And when I turned, I saw Carlos approach with a gaping mouth. No, I said. No what, he said. Carlos, don't, 
He kept marching. Then he stopped. We can take him, he said. We can take them all. No, we can't. Yes, we can. We have swords. They have sticks. We just have to kill them fast. Don't be a fool. A fool? Yes, you're a goddamn fool if you think you can kill them alone. So I am, he said. Carlos glared and turned away, and he staggered towards the tribe. I screamed and pleaded, but Carlos marched further. Then he yelled, sprinted down, and rose his sword above his head. I chased after him, thinking I could tackle him before he got halfway. But he ran too fast, and in the distance, the tribe ran towards us. Carlos approached the first Indian, and I watched him slash his throat. He did the same to the next Indian, and the next. He looked back at me with ravaged yellow eyes. But then, a swarm of Indians came in from either side, and the second I saw them, I knew Carlos hadn't a chance. They piled onto him, took off his armor, and ripped out his intestines with their spears. I was too far away. If I screamed, I knew the tribe would chase after me and kill me next. So I ran back, as fast and as far as I could. I ran for about five miles. I didn't know whether my life would end or not. I tripped over a rock and collapsed to the ground. For a moment, I thought for sure I had died. But as I got up, I found my mule. I climbed on its back and kicked it into motion and held on its reins as tight as I could. After a mile or two, I slowed down and the mule whimpered and moaned. The sun was about to die and I stopped and rested. Going alone at night was too much of a risk. Again, I was alone. Again, I was alive. And as the next morning came, I took the mule and rode back south with the vaguest notion of what to expect. I was well far out in the distance, and I could still see the tribe's fires from the south. I figured that I was five miles from them, and I kept my pace, kicking the mule to go faster. Ten minutes later or so, I felt safe enough to give pause. I got off the mule, walked by its side, and held loose to its reins. Its head sunk lower and lower, and it groaned. And by then, I knew it was only a matter of time. I gave him a half hour, then another. There was nothing left to the mule. Its eyes were red and looked as if it was bleeding internally. Then the mule staggered and lost its stride. It stumbled and leaned to the right, and after another minute, it tumbled down and collapsed. Flies gathered, and I watched the blood spew from its mouth. I walked alone, and still I found no water. And still the heat of the day choked me from top to bottom. I staggered and stumbled, just like the mule. With each step, it felt like knives had pierced underneath my feet. If there was any time to die, this would be the day. I figured I had one more day. One more day to struggle, and then I would die, and it would all be over. Again, I heard the strange voices of my nightmares. The voices in the desert once again followed me through the plains. They grew in volume but they were indiscernible. Then I saw a line of horses run off through the distance. By some miracle, I'd made it back. A captain saluted me. I forgot his name. Captain Sardina! Yes. You're alive! Yes. We thought you died, he said. I thought I did too. He didn't smile. He just looked at me and sighed. So what happened? What did you find? Where's your scout, Sardina? Carlos, wasn't it? He died, sir, I said. Where's your mule, he said. He died, too. You're quite an unlucky fellow, aren't you? So what's out there? What did you find? I stared at him. I merely shook my head.
Later that afternoon, I approached Coronado's tent. I was informed that he had been scouting two miles west, so I waited until nightfall. There was a black moon with a pale outline, and I stared at it long and hard. As night came, the men gathered around the fire, but they sang no songs. They merely sat in the cold. Coronado arrived a few minutes later. He looked dejected and bitter. He looked weary and frail, and I waited until I could talk to him in private. Nothing, Sardina, he said. No, I said. I didn't find a thing. There was nothing there, just a poor village. And when I told him the rest, Coronado looked like the saddest man in the world. I found myself alone again, and I held my head against the rock and tried to sleep. A man approached me as I lay on my side. He sat beside me and inhaled from a straw pipe that was lit of fire. It took me several minutes to realize that the man was the Turk. And all he did was smile back at me. I looked long and hard at that damn disastrous, wonderless smile. It was the same smile he gave me when I first met him. But I let it pass and went back to sleep. I had no dreams, no visions, no voices. And when I awoke again, it was still dark. But for some reason, I felt eyes watching me. And as I turned, I saw the Turk sitting in the same exact spot. He was still smiling. The land melted. The sun blazed on through its apex. The heat hovered and choked. The flat land continued. It was a yellow, dead crust of a land that seemed not to end. But the Spanish pressed on. At the head of the line, Coronado rode on his stallion, and the Turk staggered beside him, with his head tilted to the heavens. They marched and stumbled. They were still in love with the illusion. Yet they were no longer proud. Their armor had been worn out, rusted, and seeped with holes. But between the objects and the characters, between the Turk and Coronado, between the wagons and empty chest, between the monks and the captains, the men, the horses, and dogs, was a forgotten song that faded in the sun, and it was never sung again. Days died. Days repeated. Nights did as well. They were dark and cool, and as the Spanish slept, the Turk remained awake. And as the wolves howled at the moon, the Turk did as well, croaking as if from his own gizzard. The land kept going. It kept going and going. A month and two, and three. And the yellow and dead grass stared at us, and we stared right back at it. I felt it slowly trying to swallow us whole, as if a whale opened in its mouth. Many times, I couldn't believe we were still here. As the silence took over, I forgot how to speak, and for days on end, I couldn't speak a word. Brother Luis's voice repeated ceaselessly in my mind. We must pass an endless golden field, and on the other side of the Grand River, Givera lies and hold. The river. Ah, the river. I wanted nothing more than just to see it, just like I did in Peru. But the land went on. There was no river in sight. Our rations were paltry. Many other men from other divisions came to ask for bread, and we simply denied them. Some nights we ate the leather from our boots. Other nights we ate the rats that we found beneath the weeds. But whether starved or not, I still heard the men cry as they remembered their old best dreams. Givera, Givera, my whole life depends on it.
But when? When? We've gone on too long. When we reached the river. I spent my entire fortune. I spent my whole life. We will. But they were still only words. Plenty and worthless words. Like the grass we marched upon. And words like that can heal only certain wounds. The truth of the matter was, we were lost again. Both in soul and in mind. But we pressed onward. Onward towards our pure and outrageous majesty. And the Turk led us on. Days. Weeks. Months. They were all the same. The land kept going. We had sold our souls. And the devil had his way. March turned to April. Coronado sent out his men to go out and hunt. And off they rode five miles north to once again meet the mighty buffalo. The plan was to simply restock and replenish their rations. They thought it would be easy, like it was in Tiji. They thought that in a single afternoon, they would bring forth hides of innumerable numbers. And they thought that the land that they roam was still ripe with these beautiful beasts they so longed to slaughter. Through the howling winds of the prairie, the men raced their horses, and through the squalls of freezing rain, they unleashed their dogs to search the land. They loaded their cannons and watched the rolling skies hover over in snow. And they waited. They waited, because that's all they could do. A whole day passed, then another, then yet another. But in all that time, they found nothing. There was no sight of the herd, no piles of dung, no traces or tracks, no hides of warmth and comfort. There was just the endless, gigantic void before them. The tireless, treeless country of which below stood grass of prairie. And as it came, the simple facts struck them all in the face. The beasts were gone. There was not a single one left, and it was all too apparent that nature would no longer feed them. At the end of the third day, the men went back to Coronado and informed him of the bad news. Go back, he said to him. Go forth and hunt again. And the men did. The hunters went back, took to their muskets, and forged their way through the prairie once more. The snow drifted and overtook, but the buffalo had vanished. And day after day, the Spanish continued to find none of the kind. Another team of hunters rode up from the south, but as they made their way back to camp, they hung their heads in disappointment. In two days, the remaining men returned. Only two of the men brought back anything worthwhile, which were six stringy and gangly-looking hares. And as the cold sun had set, they ate and cursed. We trekked on, mile after mile. The land gave nothing but pain. And all throughout it, nothing seemed to grow or breathe. In quiet moments, the Turk kept his hands to his side, and when he opened his mouth, he yawned loudly and provoked. The Turk snickered, then giggled as if he heard a bad joke. And he kept laughing. But what paid me the most was that every time I awoke, the Turk had sat by my side and stared at me and smiled. He did this six times. At times I ignored him. At times I wanted to slice his head right off. But one time I gave in. I looked into his dark, maddening eyes, and I sunk into his everlastingly cruel and controlling trance. He reached out his finger and pointed to himself, then at me, and for the longest time, I stared. Then the Turk handed me a bowl filled with gray and blue powder. At first I refused, 
He took the bowl away from me, ingested the contents, smiled, then handed the bowl back to me. I took the bowl in my hands. It smelled like a rotten corpse. Then I took the bowl and drank what was in it. It tasted awful. And nothing happened for several minutes. The clomps of the horses settled into a horrid rhythm. Clomp, stomp, clomp, slump, pent, sump, clump, slump, pent, slump. And I found it hard to keep my eyes open. I heard my men call my name, but I did not see them. Aside from the melting sands, what was left to see was a blue sky covered with clouds. But then I felt a sharp pain that started from my throat. In the heat, I felt my eyes want to shoot out from their sockets, and in one instance, my head swelled. I fell to my knees, then I fell to my side. And then, all had turned black. Voices pierced like splinters. Dreams, Sardina. They were. They came in and out. They rushed and surged and took over. I drifted in. I drifted out. I saw shadows dark and red. My heart raced. I felt as if I were drowning. And I knew I had killed my world. I tried to get to my feet, but it was the most difficult task ever imaginable. Then I fell. I slipped. And I drowned. Deep. And forever. I passed the absurd. I passed lifetimes, both future and past. I saw Christ in Golgotha. I saw this cross and the crowd. But then I elevated. I rode a vulture's wings and I flew throughout the sky. And up and up I went. I saw myself and the men from above. God had taken me away for a moment and let me see it all from above. And suddenly I was overcome by a terrible, joyous feeling. I heard church bells. I heard them chime through weddings and funerals. Ding dong dong. Ding dong dong. I came to the surface for a brief second, and I screamed at the men. God damn it, men! Don't you hear it? They gave no reply. And back I went into the vision. I found myself alone. The land was still dead. There were no birds or angels in the sky. I was taken into the fields. I was drawn by voices. But I heard my father's voice the clearest. It gets late early, son. There's no time to waste. And at the end of the earth, I saw him and embraced him as long as I could. Father? Why? Father? But he merely shook his head. And when I saw his face again, I knew it was him. I hugged him. I hugged him long and hard. And I didn't want to let go. I heard him laughing through his tears. And I saw him through the grain. And the look on his face said it all. It was a baffling acceptance of his struggling son. We looked on to the sad skies and prayed for rain. But then he slipped into my arms and disappeared. It gets late early, son. No silver, no gold, not in this life. I followed down to see more of the hell I had created. But then the land turned black and white. Squares of the game erected from the earth, tall as trees, and their edges went as far as the eyes could see. The game became real. The game was all I saw. Squares of black and white, from the ground to the sky. And as I looked up, I felt it rain. But it wasn't water. Rather, what fell were pieces of stone. They were all pawns, and they fell down sharp like spears, and pounded and split my head wide open. Then I turned into a river of blood, wide and whole, steam and fire, 
And again, the bells chimed. It gets late early, son. But then the chimes stop. And as I looked below to the sands, I found them broken, cracked, and dismembered. And with a hammer in his hand, I saw the Turk bang the bells over and over. But there was no sound. And again, the Turk laughed. But with each strike, the metal became liquid and quickly dissolved into thin air. And the Turk cheered and laughed and smacked his lips and ate a handful of sand. Then he pointed and laughed and disappeared. I saw a steady stream of hurtling spirits arrive. They shook the ground, and I saw the moon part and drift away. And as it did, the demons were summoned and came riding through on ragged wings. The devils, the horrid devils of the desert, whom I knew so well. Red and black, restless, heinous, lost souls. They rushed and purged and screeched and bled. And as they followed the light, they reached the golden image. And for once, I could see them up close. And when the truth came to me, I wept. For the devils were ourselves. And I was among them. They were Coronado and Tovar, Cardenas and Castaneda, and myself. We were dead, and we all turned to stone. Then we crumbled, broke off the pieces, and afterwards washed back in the tide. Lost and forgotten by time. And above was the distance, the future, and the surging river. I awoke, somehow. I was still alive. I didn't know where I was or what day it was. Then I heard a voice. You've been quite ill, sir, said one of the men. It was one of the Diaz brothers. How? How long? I said. About two days. We thought you died. Where? Where are we? The man smiled. It doesn't matter, sir. What? It doesn't matter. You're alive, Captain Sardina. And we did it. Did what? We're here. We've reached Kivera. He pointed to the river. It appeared right there in between the plain and sand. I followed it down. I found a pile of mud. Then I found a stream. I watched it gleam. And I cried. But my tears were not of joy. I knelt to the ground and thought my heart would stop. For within the river, I felt it. Not the cities. Not the gold. But the truth. The whole and undeniable truth. I felt it. I saw it, and I knew it in whole. The truth of the dream. The truth of the damned. We were not to find these cities. They existed only in our minds. We were fools who spent our whole lives chasing a dream. The dream was an empty lie. We were fools. Damn fucking fools. And that's why the Turk had smiled. When I looked at him again that day, I saw the same smile. He was dancing alone and welcomed the great moon with a howl. Then I saw him step on a scorpion. He neither flinched nor did he pause. Instead, he bent over, picked up the scorpion, allowed it to sting his finger, and then he crushed it with the flat end of his other hand. And when it was dead, he dropped it back to the ground and stared right back at me. And again, the Turk laughed.
Kivera, a city by the river. The words were whispered. The obsession. The ritual. And the gold is there where the rivers cross. Those were the Turk's words, but they were spoken by Luis. He closed his eyes and prayed, and he remembered the day. The men searched and chased up and down the river. They searched through the dead hollow trees. They searched through the banks north and the life of the world to come. But Luis did not follow. Instead, he stayed back and bit his lip until it bled. And as Luis dipped his head in the river, he thought of Marcos, the canyon, the desert, and all the familiar and forgotten tales. And in prayer, Luis heard Marcos' voice again, and again he could see his frantic eyes. The drums blared, the birds screeched. Luis, Luis, don't you see? The cities! He tried and tried again, but all he saw was the desert, the sun, and the canyon. And the more Luis tried to see, the more he could not. Why don't you believe me? Luis, Luis, you have to believe me. The light, Luis. Don't you see? But still, Luis could not. I looked at Luis many times that day. I knew he had lost his mind. His face said it all. He was beyond demoralized, and his eyes looked dead and gray. His robes draped along the yellow grass. His eyes were closed, and his hands kept trembling the same way Marcos's hands had done. He moaned and shivered and paced in all directions. I heard him hold conversations entirely by himself. Sometimes he spoke in a baritone. Sometimes he babbled incoherently, reciting prayers only a monk would know. But he was always alone. And for a straight half hour, I saw him dip his head in the water and then yell out in pain as if he had been stabbed, as if all the life had been taken from him. Then he recited the rosary and murmured it through his tears. Our Father, who art in heaven, if only he would appear. Then again I thought of the cities, that lie he held on to for so long. I wanted to ask him if he had seen them, but I knew he didn't. I knew he was still in denial. I knew he was coming apart at the seams. And as he sobbed, I clutched onto him as a father would do to a child. There was nothing else I could do. The men tore through the land. They slipped and fell between the sands and the basins, and they went knee-deep into the river's bend. They growled and stormed and muttered, and as they reached the river south, they watched the Turk jump up and down in frantic pleasure. He looked like a child, a six-foot child with beaming demon eyes. And he shrieked and screamed in pure, ecstatic joy. The men shrieked back. This is not gold! You bastard! Where is it? Where is this kid? Ah! The cries were repeated in ebbs and flows, and the men shouted to the sun wanted to strike it with their spears. And that made the Turk laugh even more. He pointed over to the grass and plains, and like a priest, the Turk outstretched his hands to the sky. And as the day blurred on, the men grew enraged. God damn that Turk! Kill him! Kill him now! And there in the sky emerged that heinous black bird I admired so much. Once more, it blocked the sun, and once more, I watched it swoop and swirl over the twelve-foot grain. I stood amazed. It made not a sound, but as the skies darkened, I knew its fate, and when I heard a shot from the distance pierce the air, several more had followed. Then I watched that beautiful dark bird fall to the ground, and later I heard the dogs rip what was left of it and the moon replaced the sun. As night approached, the rumors resurfaced 
and a great excitement returned. The men huddled around the fires as alive as they were back in Compostela. Many of them said they saw something glow from afar. It was Kivera. They were convinced. How many miles did not matter, and half the men were ordered to trek all night to find it. And as they reported all this to Coronado, a great relief had come across his face. I can't remember much of that night. I only remember the excitement on the men's faces, especially the faces of my men, whom I felt the most pity for. I asked no questions. I merely listened. And when I was asked by the men why I looked so sad, I simply said to them that I was tired. It was the truest thing I could think of. If I had told them the real truth, they wouldn't have believed me. Wine poured. It was sweet and tart. I had my share and grew sick of it. And again, I looked to the Turk. It was by himself on the other side of the camp. And again, I looked at Luis, who slept under a pile of wool. And again, the men sang songs and laughed. And off they dreamt. The soon-to-be kings. But my eyes could no longer stay open and I dropped my face to the ground. And back I went, into the void. Then came the day. I woke up and vomited. My eyes and nose were filled with sand. I looked all around. It was still dark. The moon shone blue and purple. My men were still asleep. I walked along the river, still in a heavy daze. Then I found a body float across the tide. I went about twenty feet further by the basin. It was Luis. His robes were soaked. His naked body looked as white as porcelain. I examined the body from head to foot. He had been stabbed in the stomach and his neck. And as I held Luis by his head, I saw that both of his eyes had been gouged. I cried for help. I cried many times, but no one came my way. All were still asleep, and all I heard was the tide. I carried Luis's corpse back to camp. My men were nowhere to be found. There were only a couple men left over from the other unit. Most of them were monks and slaves. The men looked startled, but they weren't shocked. They asked no questions. I approached the monks and told them what had happened. Then they made an immediate vigil and laid Luis's body on a pile of straw. They prayed and murmured, and I left the site and returned to my men. I looked for the Turk. I searched up and down many times. I asked all around. I told each man that Brother Luis had died and the Turk was missing, but they seemed not to care. Another captain came to my side. His face struck me odd, but I recognized him right away. I remembered his face back in Compostela, where all the captains had gathered. I remember sneering at his bulbous nose and that ugly, pompous face of his. Nothing had changed. I approached him, and once again, he looked right through me. What the hell is going on? Don't you know? he said. No. We found them, Sardina. It's done. We found them all. Found what? The cities. Kivera. They went ahead at night. They couldn't wait until morning. Who found them? I asked. Coronado. Who else? And Cardenas. I believe he found them too. They're only three miles away. Three or four. And why are you still here? I asked. Coronado ordered me to stay at camp. Lucky bastards. Stealing all the glory. Why do you ask? Didn't you get the same orders? No. I guess they forgot about you, he said. Who else is with them? I said. Tovar, I think. What about the Turk? 
The captain laughed. Then he shook his head and laughed some more. The Turk, I repeated. What about him? Where is he? I couldn't care less where that bastard is. Dead, I suppose. If not alive somewhere. It doesn't matter now. Yes, it does, I shouted. When's the last time you saw him? Last night, I think. Then he looked at me strange and laughed again. Why does that matter to you, he said. We found it. We found Kivera. That's what matters. That's all that matters. I hurried back and ran in circles. No, not what to do. I thought of where the Turk could be and what the men were seeing five miles down. In my haste, I fell to the ground. I got up and looked for Luis. It was the only thought I had. I shouted for him. I cried and wailed. But I already forgotten he had died. I went back to the spot where I left Luis's body. The monks were gone. All was left was his corpse. There was not another soul for miles. The smell of his corpse was so hard that I could no longer look at it. I thought long and hard and wondered who had killed him. It could have been the Turk. For all I know, it could have been Luis himself. I imagined the Diaz brothers holding their bloody knives. And I imagined Coronado with a noose in his hand, standing at the back of Luis and trying to prove himself once more. I left the corpse and shouted for help. And I screamed and begged for God to let this nightmare pass. Then I heard a squeal. I heard thrills and chirps, and as I looked back, I saw a large vulture peck and claw its way into Luis's mangled face. It smacked, chewed, gorged, picked, and swallowed globs of Luis's cold red flesh. Then the bird paused and looked at me for a single eternity of a second. But then the moment passed, and the bird turned away and continued his feast. I held my throbbing head in my hands. And again, I thought of the Turk. Then it dawned on me. And in an instant, I knew the reason why all the men had left. They wanted to see their grand finale. They wanted to see their final vision. And I ran towards them as fast as I could. They reached a bend in the river. And their eyes gazed upon the dream that was, the promise secured, and the Spanish saw it all. The rivers crossed, and Kivera stood. And indeed, it was as wide and far as the eye could see. The city of Marcos, Esteban, and the Turk. Those forgotten fools who were now honored saints. And it was finally here. Then time had stopped, and all the gold returned. The men from afar yelled in joy as they rode their horses onward. Kivera, we found it! We found it! They frolicked in raw, sweeping jest. They sounded their trumpets. The world was saved, and each man gave his testimony. Coronado ordered his men to rush the city, shouting Santiago dozens of times. Some men entered the city. Some stayed and watched. All was there, just as Marcos had said. Grand and wondrous towers. Gates as far as the eye could see. Temples. Altars. Barracks. All made of gold and for a full hour, they celebrated. Marcos was right! Marcos, you son of a bitch, you were right all along! A trance was cast, and the visions befell. The sun faded, and dark clouds hovered. And the glow of the city lit the land, and all who approached it. Then a light appeared in the distance beyond the rocks. It was a pale blue bellowing light, and it shone down. Then a long strike of lightning crashed, 
a pulsating rumble of thunder followed, and as it did, a golden chariot rode forth into sight. Two horses pulled it and headed off into the city. And when Coronado saw the chariot, he cried and wept like a child. The closer they got, the more the light blinded their eyes. They entered the buildings. They were brimmed with silver and gold, and a dazzling stream of rubies and diamonds fell from the sky. And the men frantically grabbed every jewel. And from with the clouds, each man had heard voices that were distinct to them and them alone. All of them were voices of the past. The voices sang in harmony and seemed to drift in and out, dying and returning. For Coronado, the voices were of his wife and children. And when he had reached the golden walls, he touched them and cried. Then he saw his wife and children running towards him, and he embraced them in his arms. The men took to the steps and pillars, and above the columns, they saw golden pigs who smiled down upon them. And the voices continued, moaning soft and long harmonies. And the men cried to God, overcome and beguiled. When I got close enough, I saw the light. I saw the cities too. I'll admit it, it looked grand, and it lasted for a full, uninterrupted minute. It might have lasted two minutes, but for that moment, I saw it, and for a single moment, I thought for sure we had found our Cusco. I thought for sure that we had found our El Dorado, our city in the sand. I truly wanted to believe. Then came a single white and enormous flash. A silence took over. It was a deep and perturbing and horrible silence. And then I heard a faint buzz about my head. I looked west. I looked many times, but I hadn't seen a thing. Again, I heard the buzz, and it came much louder. The sound switched from scratching to screeching, and it grew louder and louder. Seconds later, I saw a massive swarm of a million insects, and as I looked back to the sky, I saw them flutter and swarm across the horizon in swirling pockets of black. The men screamed. They were still overcome by the city, but after another minute, the swarm erupted, and the whole sky was covered in it. I fell to the ground, the whole world spun. It rolled and it reversed. Then it passed. Then it got cold. The wind blew hard and long. I looked all over. The entire ground was covered in dead white and gray locusts. I looked back at the cities. All had vanished, just as I expected them to. All was grain and sand. Great Kivara simply disappeared. It only existed in our minds. I looked at the men's faces. They shivered. They rushed forth and chased and tried to clutch the sky. But all they had to grab onto was air. They stuttered. Their eyes were big as suns. No. No, no, where is it? Where is it? I saw it, we saw it, it was there. They went about in circles. They ran and rushed back, but they could not believe the grim reality. They couldn't let go. They whispered to each other. They looked for golden doors and walls. They scoured the sands for the fallen rubies and emeralds. They trekked upon the grains thinking that they were touching the forbidden gates. But in all cases, they slipped back into hell. The hell of the real and the present. There was nothing. 
Then I heard a voice cry out in the darkness. The chest, men, bring forth the chest! The men gathered and brought out the heavy wooden chests that they had piled gold and jewels into when the first light appeared. Open them! Open them! They surrounded each chest. They fought and groveled. And when they opened them, they screamed. There was only sand. I watched Coronado take a handful of sand and run it through his hands. The screams continued. They pierced the air and followed in echoes. When I looked at the man next to me, I saw the face of a wild animal, screaming in absolute and terrible pain. More men yelled, and the land shook in a contagious wave of anger. Their faces were all the same the faces of absolute disgust and damnation. Their mouths remained open. They spat and they screamed. They needed blood. They needed war. They needed to stab and pierce and strangle. But there was no enemy in sight. There was only the Turk. And soon, every man from every unit had one primary goal to find and kill the Turk. Coronado led the way. He unleashed the dogs, and off they leapt into the grains. Then the archers and hand cannons shot rounds into the sky. I stood still. The men had left. The land remained empty and quiet. A while later, I heard the men grunt and shout out, and from the distance of their echoes, I knew they were only a quarter of a mile from me. Then all went quiet again. I walked east. I gave a minute to silence. Then I turned and followed the sun west. I went through the plains and felt each stalk with the tip of my fingers. And again, I stared at the flat sky and its impossible blue. Then I turned and saw the shadow. I followed the shadow for many minutes, and I heard a rustling among the grains. I took out my sword and swung left and right at the dry, hollow stalks. Then I yelled and shouted, begging for a response. None was given. I saw the shadow again. Then I heard a laugh. It boomed from underneath the sky, and it pierced my ears but still I could not find where it was coming from. Then the shadow rose up and over, and as I followed it down, I came upon a small straw hut, and it was there that I saw him stand, and the Turk once again greeted me with a wicked smile, and on top of his head was a skull of an antelope. We faced each other and rested, I came in closer. His giggle turned into a booming cackle, and the vibration sifted through the stalks. His body was gaunt and filled with bones. His face was scarred and black. His eyes were bright and yellow, and his stare still ghastly and gaunt. I knew for certain that this would be the last time I would ever see him alive, but somehow... I felt he knew it too. All he did was laugh and stare. Tears ran down his cheek. He grinned and pointed and danced. Then he sang. It was the same song he performed for the desert farmers back before Tiji. He kept in time. I watched him dance to and fro in time to his own beat. He danced up and down, and I looked to the sky to see if it would rain. And again, he laughed, and the sound boomed off in echoes. Then he stared straight back at me, and for the longest time, I stared, not knowing what to do. But in my heart, I knew there was only one thing I could do. I smiled back. I laughed, and I cried and I felt my soul again. <laughs>
and for another minute, we laughed like brothers. I finally understood his joke. He laughed because he had succeeded. His promise had been fulfilled. He had driven us to nothing. And because I knew all of this, I said not a word. I just stared and laughed with him and waited for the inevitable. I heard the dogs bark out in the distance. Then I heard the horses. I turned to my side and saw a dozen men rush over. And a minute later, I saw the Turk reach into the hut and retrieve a wooden cross, which he began to wave frantically. He moved past the hut and out into the open, and I stood silent and watched and waited. But somehow, I knew this was exactly what the Turk had wanted. The Turk raced further out and waved his hand, begging the men to kill him. He yelled and howled, and the men cursed back at him. But still, the Turk waved his cross and yelled. And his laugh howled across the land for the final time. He laughed and danced and laughed again. And he ran with a cross above his head, like a child flying a kite. Then from behind, I saw the dogs pile onto his back. The dogs drove the Turk to the ground. They tore through his knees and gashed his arms. Then a stream of arrows launched from the left. The arrows struck not only the Turk, but also the dogs. An order was yelled, and about a half a dozen men took the Turk's mangled body, wrapped him in chains, and dragged him through the dirt. But for whatever reason, the Turk did not scream. He uttered not a sound. They took him to Coronado, who was only an eighth of a mile south. A crowd gathered and watched the execution. It was quick and discreet. Coronado stood and waited, and as the translators arrived, he wandered to the Turk. The translators asked the long and questions which every man had feared. With a skull still on his head, the Turk was questioned in brief yes or no answers. He replied with the all too obvious truth. And then he confessed to all with his damning, profound, and hideous smile. There were no cities of gold. There was no Kivara. There was no grand city of yore. There was only desert and plains in this land. He made it all up. Coronado and the Turks stared at each other for the longest time. And when the translators finished, Coronado approached the Turk, grabbed the skull from his head, and smashed it across the Turk's face. And Coronado screamed once more. Blood poured and splattered. The Turk's face was mauled beyond measure. But even then, I knew the Turk had won. For although bloodied, his smile retained, and his eyes were still lit with pure and righteous ecstasy. And the more Coronado screamed, the more the Turk looked as if he were the happiest man on the face of the earth. And with that final glare, the Turk again laughed. He hissed, and he cackled. And he spat his blood and laughed even more. Coronado turned away, and when he looked at me, I saw his true face. It reminded me of the face I had seen back in Compostela when I finished telling him my story of Peru. It was a face of fear and sadness. The two executioners entered with ropes in their hands, and in less than a minute, the Turk was strangled and left dead on the cold ground. Finally, the sun had died, and as we made camp, all I could do was stare at the angry, bitter, and sad faces among me. The next morning, the captains held a meeting. We discussed only one issue and agreed unanimously. We would return to Mexico immediately. <laughs>
At sunset, I went up to Coronado. He shook my hand, but he stayed silent and sullen. His face faded in the sun, and he looked like all of us. Broken. And like that, the dream had died. West. Back to Mexico. Back to Compostela. We rode on with our backs to the plains. Throughout the day, there was a split in pain in my head. And as the river surged, the quiet day soon died. And before I knew it, dusk had arrived. Throughout the night, the pain had followed me. At times, I couldn't even blink. I felt the pain deep within my heart. It was deep and prime and pure. And the closer I came to the river, the more I had felt it. I heard its every sound and was caught by its pool. Its surges and shifts felt real and true. And my heart felt it most. I became one with the river. It was as if it were speaking to me. And as I listened, it told me the only truth I needed to know. That I was not my past and that I would not live in it anymore. I asked the river more questions, but most of them remained unanswered. Then a voice cried out and told me I would find the answers at the river's end. And before dawn had settled to early light, I awoke and left the camp. And I was alone again. Along the trail back west, the Spanish rode on. The sun broke through the clouds. With a pained face, Coronado looked back at his men. His sad, uncrowned, languished kings. He looked back to the horizon. His mind drifted and spilled onto the sands. His memory cracked like mirrors. And he fell into another daze. The thoughts resurfaced. The thoughts of his wife and children. The thoughts of the painful years of sorrow that was to be his future. But mostly, it was the thought of the horrid desert that he and his men had passed through and would have to pass through once more. A scout interrupted. Sir, said the scout. Coronado ignored and gazed into the sky. Sir the scout repeated. Yes, yes, what is it? We've seen the lost contact with Captain Sardina. Sardina? Yes, sir. We can't find him anywhere. Don't worry about Sardina. He'll find his way. Again, Coronado rode on phase. A strange and long silence had followed him and the sun beat down stronger with every hour. Then the days settled a little deeper, and Coronado tipped his head once more. He sputtered his words to the angels above, and back he drifted into wonderless dreams. He heard no sounds, no voices or music, and again he fell to a pool of dreams so far away. Above, he saw a grail brought by the angels. And below, he saw a city scattered with all the souls he had killed. Then more images emerged from the ground. They appeared as faces, all too weary, from places unadorned. New Galicia, Paisor de Mendoza, the Valley of the Corazones, Marcos, the Desert. T.G. Beatrice. And then for a grand second, he saw the great cities of gold, and he watched them all glimmer as he dipped his head again. Then he heard a faint, familiar sound. It dissipated, then returned. It came louder. It swerved through the bends of the clouds, 
and it crashed and clanged off his armor. And it pounded and reverberated. And as he turned, Coronado yelled because the sound was in direct syncopation with his racing heart. His men paused and stared, and as he looked above, Coronado screamed. Something had blocked the sun. It was the hard blackbird, and it swirled above his head. It swooped and fluttered, and as Coronado caught the bird in sight, his entire body jolted, as if he were struck by lightning. And down he went. He fell down from his horse and landed on his head. The men rushed and surrounded him. They shouted and pleaded and prayed. General! General! The men stopped and shouted again. They screamed and pleaded and prayed at his side. But Coronado could not hear them. His face was smeared in dirt, and he bled from his forehead. He stared at a tiny speck of iron pyrite and picked it up from the ground. He squinted and exhaled, and a stream of blood shot out from his nose. In a slow, painful minute, he forced himself back to his feet. He stood for another minute and stared at his men. Then finally, he made it back to his horse and forced himself back up the saddle. He rode on. His men followed. But every morning Coronado awoke, he yelled and yelled again. And when he opened his eyes, all he saw was the empty desert before him. The sound had followed him throughout his dreams and reveries. And it stayed within his mind until the day he died. The sound was a never-ending chorus. The sound was the living nightmare he could not escape. And as his men looked at him with grave concern, Coronado wallowed and shrieked and cried painful tears. And all he heard was the bellowing laughter of the Turk. The river surged. I followed it down. It seemed so long ago. Spain, the jungle, the desert. They all seemed so long ago. There were many thoughts I had that day. I thought of the men many times. But I knew they would be fine without me. They were hardened. And after what they struggled through, I knew they could bear through anything. Later, I thought of Coronado. And I knew I would never see him again. I thought of the burden that brought me here and the impossibility of our obsession, our endless obsession, and our endless dreams of pure and utter want. The want to know, the want to hold, the want for gold and God. And it was then that I'd understood what the repetition of hell really was a perpetual hell of conquest and obsession that was sheer and utter madness. And what, until this very day, was what my entire life had been based upon. I thought of all the desert farmers, those in the valley and those beyond. They weren't poor at all. They were rich. They were rich in life and happiness. They were just like my father. They were kind, and they were beautiful. We lived for the future. They lived in the present. And they looked at us with utmost pity. And then I thought about the Turk. He was the only man to show me just how empty my life was. For nearly all my life, I desperately wanted to believe in something that simply wasn't there. I had wasted my entire life chasing this dream. And when I saw the Turk breathe his last, I knew the words he said didn't matter. 
What mattered was that he smiled. If the trick had come to pass, and I had understood it in whole, and I understood how much of a fool I truly was. Even if I were to have all the gold in Peru, it wouldn't matter to me anymore. Gold meant absolutely nothing. But his trick did much more than that. It awoke me. I opened my eyes and revealed all this precious life I had refused to live. And as the rest of my thoughts died that day, the only thing left was the river. And I was grateful. The river was the most beautiful thing on earth, and it heard my cries and kept me company. Its current raged and turned. It soothed and healed me. And I heard it laugh and swoon. And again, it kept on flowing. They repeated, just like the Amazon. And as it raced, I saw its beauty. And it reminded me that I was still alive. I needed no other divinity. And for the first time in my life, I felt my mind at peace. And the only desire I had left was to see the river's end and listen to its song. However vague it may seem to you, it was true as rain to me. I needed no miracles. I needed no savior. It was up to me to find my own meaning. And I knew if I followed the river to its end, I would find my soul again. I studied my hands. I moved my fingers and sighed, but then I smiled. And as the waning sun had set, I saw the men for the very last time. They were a mile south from where I stood. I heard their steel pound the land as they marched, and I watched the rusted wagons and caravans sputter off in the distance. I wanted to shout at them. I wanted to climb over and let out a cry. But I didn't. I didn't say a word. And another minute later, they faded away from my sight.